Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the launch of the new Global Energy Center report, Shifting Gears, Geopolitics of the Global Energy Transition, written by GEC Senior Fellow and Managing Director for Energy, Climate and Resources at the Eurasia Group, RJ Johnston. Shifting Gears looks at the geopolitical implications of a prospective peak in oil demand, as well as the implications for producing and consuming countries. My name is Randy Bell, and I'm the director here at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, and I will be moderating today's event. Also joining us uh, today for a panel discussion on the report and the topic overall will be Amy Myers Jaffe, who is a research professor and the managing director of the Climate Policy Lab at the Tufts Fletcher School, and Chris Midgley, who is the global head of analytics at S&P Global Platts. Before I turn it over to RJ for some key highlights of the report, just a few housekeeping notes. So this is, we hope this will be a very interactive uh, event and interactive conversation. So to ask questions, please use the Q&A function uh, in part of Zoom. And we always encourage you to engage with us on Twitter at AC Global Energy using the hashtag AC Energy. So with that, RJ, uh, over to you for your uh, initial presentation. Thanks very much, Randy. And uh, I'd certainly like to start by expressing my appreciation to the Atlantic Council and the Smith Richardson Foundation for the support for this project. It's been great working with you and with Reed and Jennifer and, and Dick and the team. And uh, thanks to Amy and Chris for their comments today as well. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. I've got some, some um, uh, summary here of, of the uh, report and it won't take too long to go through and then we can uh, see what others think. <clears throat> Okay, let's see here. Great. So what are the parameters of the study? What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, I think the inspiration for this when we first started talking about it, you know, two or three years ago was really we were at that point starting to see a, a wave of, of assessments of peak demand scenarios. Uh, but the focus was really on what kind of oil demand outlook do we need to come into alignment with the Paris Agreement in a carbon neutral global economy uh, and a lot of modeling on the transportation sector or the petrochemical sector, uh, you know, EV uh, forecasts, things like that, that, that continue to this day, including the IEA's recent net zero scenario. But of course, at Eurasia Group, uh, where I'm the uh, head of the energy climate resources team, uh, we always think about the geopolitical and country risk and policy implications. So. I didn't want to work with Atlantic Council and do another kind of forecast of, of when oil demand will peak and what the various policy tools will be uh, to get there, whether it's carbon taxes or maybe internal combustion engine. Um, really much more a question of if oil demand peaks or when it does, what happens next, especially in terms of the questions around the future of oil producers. So we're not trying to replicate another net zero scenario like the IA has or another EV forecast or anything like that. But it's really about the after effects of peak demand once we get there, uh, or perhaps we say when we get there. So there are a lot of angles we could take. You know, We chose to take two particular angles in this study. The first question was really the question of, in a peak demand world, uh, you know, what happens to market share among the major oil producing countries? Does it look like it does today? Only everyone's producing less? Or is there some other factors that will shape that redistribution of market share? And then relatedly, um, what are the geopolitical and foreign policy consequences of that redistribution? Uh, of course, demand will peak. And then as you can see in the, in the uh, chart on the right-hand side of this um, slide, of course, the expectation is that demand will peak and then decline. So this study doesn't take a view on the accuracy of these forecasts. It just takes them as an input and a thought exercise to consider the geopolitical and market share redistribution questions. There are other questions, of course, that we could have looked at and maybe touch on a little bit. There's questions around the just transition, what it means for, you know, for regional governments and for fossil fuel workers and communities. There's questions about how IOCs and NOCs should recalibrate their strategies for this world. And there's, there's questions, of course, about the investment and capital market implications of all this. And I think those are things that we can touch on, but Again, the real focus here is those first two, the redistribution of market share and the geopolitics. So, so in terms of picking a couple of scenarios, we picked the IEA's SDS, and this is using 2019 uh, data. It hasn't changed that much over the last couple of years. And then we, 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 you know, we wanted to find a really radical 
decarbonization peak demand scenario, radical, not in terms of the politics, but more in terms of the, the slope of the, of the peak and the decline. So the UN environmental program has a report called the production gap report that actually, as you can see here, uh, forecasts a much sharper decline, a much earlier peak and sharper decline than the IEA's SDS scenario. So we use those two scenarios. SDS, which has you know 65 million barrels a day of demand in 2040, and the production gap report, which has 38 million barrels a day of demand in 2040. Now, for context, as most of you know, we're at about 95, 96 million barrels a day of demand right now, uh, coming out of the COVID pandemic. So that kind of transformation from a world of you know 95 to 100 million barrels a day of demand to a world of between you know 38 and 65 million barrels a day of demand, we think will have some big implications in terms of market share redistribution and the associated geopolitics. So, you know, just continuing with some of the IA data here, right? So I thought this was a really interesting graphic that IA had in their last uh, World Energy Outlook, which is the question of what does happen to investment, right? That, you know, the, the continued need for, for reinvestment in the industry to keep pace with demand. Um, obviously at the top of the chart here, the step scenario, the business as usual scenario, the suggestion is that we're going to need a lot more new fields that come online. If you look at the SDS scenario, which is one of the two that we looked at in the study, there's obviously a lesser amount of new supply that's needed to meet future demand. Uh, but what's not shown here, because it sort of came out after this report was finished, was the net zero scenario from the IEA. But what's interesting is that the IEA's net zero scenario is quite closely aligned with the production gap report. So that would suggest that in, in those scenarios, we only really need existing fields, right, to meet that level of, of demand at, you know, 35 uh, to 40 million barrels a day, which is sort of that range of the UN production gap report and the IA net zero scenario. So obviously, again, big consequences here, which suppliers will drop out of the stack, right, and, and, and will become stranded assets, or in some cases, stranded countries in the context of these big shifts of demand. So how do we attempt to solve this problem? Well, I'm interested to see what people think. I mean, it's sort of a first effort at this. And I think, you know, we've looked at a lot of different data sources and started to think about how, how industry will allocate capital against these future demand scenarios. And I think we could probably all agree that at least the most important factors, and maybe not the only factor, but probably the most important factors that will determine how industry, the oil and gas industry, invests its future capital in new oil production will have a lot to do with cost and with risk and with the, the sort of carbon intensity and ESG alignment of the resource opportunities. So future investment will reflect some combination of these metrics. So in my view, I, I you know, perhaps arbitrarily allocated these, you know, 30% cost, 50% risk, 20% carbon. If we did this five or 10 years ago, maybe carbon wouldn't have been a factor at all. And maybe cost would have been more important. But I want to put risk pretty high because I think the idea here is that IOCs will be risk averse entering this period of eventual peak demand. And they'll want to make sure to the extent that they can, that they're targeting future oil production uh, that is low cost, uh, relatively low risk and, and low carbon intensity. So we wanted to build some data indicators that would reflect that. Now, what that means is that we think the AIOCs will be looking for countries and, and upstream markets that are resilient in the context of the energy transition and in the peak demand world. Oil producing countries that have these characteristics of being relatively low cost, relatively low risk and low carbon uh, and ESG friendly. And the hypothesis is that those countries will be more likely not just to attract new investment which again, you need a little bit of new investment in SDS and, and really not much in that production gap report or net zero scenario, but it's probably more about retaining investment, right? Having, having an ongoing uh, competitive barrel in, in this peak demand energy transition scenario. So the idea that we came up with here was resilience, right? Oil market resilience, transition resilience, producers that will be here for the longer term, even as we move towards peak demand. So let me give you a couple of examples. We looked at about 18 or 20 different data points, which you can read about in the study, but just to pick a couple of examples here, I think cost of capital is an important consideration. And there's a number of different ways to measure this. Uh, but 
I think what's notable from this example here, and that we'll get to the conclusion of the report, is that there's a big differential between, you know, those that have access to low cost of capital, like the Saudis or the UAE, and those that are paying a big premium, a big risk premium for their cost of capital, which is a lot of the West African, Latin American, uh, you know, and countries like Iraq. So when it comes to being low cost, obviously the lower cost of capital, the better. And if you have to pay a big premium, then your, your barrels may not be as competitive over the medium term. So that's sort of one topic we can delve into. The other one that's interesting, I think, then as again, as I mentioned, that's gaining more relevance, I think, in the context of, of future allocation here is gr the greenhouse gas intensity of oil production. And what's interesting here, I think, is that one of the conclusions of the study is that uh, the, the GCC countries in particular have the advantage of being low cost and low carbon, which positions them well for a world of peak demand, in our opinion. And by contrast, some of the higher risk, higher cost markets also have high greenhouse gas intensity. And the data on the right is from BP's last World Energy Outlook. And it basically says that when you adjust from their business as usual case to the rapid transition scenario, they see a much bigger adjustment in terms of downward supply from that dark blue wedge of the pie, which is the most greenhouse gas intensive producers. So they're saying in line with my study, right, that as, as oil demand declines and market share gets reallocated, the most greenhouse gas intensive producers will see the biggest downward revision in supply, which is I think really, really interesting and worth digging into more. So I won't belabor the methodology here. Uh, certainly email me, call me if you have questions. But essentially, we divided the 15 oil producers into four categories, the 15 largest core GCC countries, North America plus, which really means like plus Mexico, Brazil, Norway, Russia as a category in of itself, and then what I call you know fragile and fa failed states, right? Some of the you know really geopolitically challenged states like Libya and Venezuela as well as the states that maybe are, are not failed, but are struggling and more fragile like Iraq or Algeria or Nigeria, for example, that, that maybe don't have the same, you know, uh, in Eurasia groups metrics, the same kind of internal political stability and, and um, resilience as some of the other, other countries. So then we took all those data points. We ranked each, each cat uh, for each category, we ranked, we, we ranked each grouping and, you know, came to the conclusion based on the data that, um, you know, some some of these regions would be better positioned for a world of peak demand than others, based on the assessment of the metrics of cost, uh, risk, and and carbon intensity or ESG alignment. So, what do the conclusions look like? Well, we had one set of conclusions for the SDS scenario, right, a world of 65 million barrels a day, and then another set of conclusions for the production gap report of 38 million barrels a day, which again is quite close to that IA net zero scenario. So, obviously. In all these scenarios, everyone's production uh, is down. But what we concluded was that in that group of fragile and failed states, you would actually some, see some of the countries on the right-hand side of the chart basically be out of the oil business, right? And it would no longer have, uh, in, in that 2040 to 2050 window with peak demand, they wouldn't be producing oil anymore. They'd be producing a very marginal amount. Countries like Saudi Arabia, the US, Russia would see a very material drop in production but would still be, you know, the world's largest producers. Um, and, and I think that's going to be really the foundation of our geopolitical analysis, right? What, and of course, it's all hypothetical, but if this is the role that we move into, then what are the geopolitical implications that, that flow from that? So just to conclude, a few thoughts on the geopolitics, right? So our, our basic conclusion here is that, um, you know, the core GCC region, Russia, and North America, um, will either hold their market share or we'll, we'll see sort of modest declines, but we'll see the bigger decline in that group of fragile and failed states, just because there's not gonna be enough capital to go around. Uh, and I think that those fragile and failed states have the biggest barriers to retaining investment or attracting new investment uh, in the context of being low cost and low carbon. As we go to this transition, you know, the existence of failed states, oil producing states in the past, think Venezuela in 2002 or Iraq in 2007, those have been upward, you know, sources of, of uh, pressure on oil prices, right? We have a major producer fail, uh, especially if it happens in the next five or 10 years, right? That would, you know, where we still have pretty strong demand. Um, and obviously the geopolitical implications of a, of a failed state in summer like Iraq would be profoundly impactful on countries like Saudi Arabia, Israel, Iran, et cetera. And then other states like Angola or Nigeria might be more of a humanitarian 
consideration uh, for U.S. foreign policy. Now, what about the big producers, right? So just briefly, I think generally this study makes Russia and Saudi Arabia look pretty good, right? That they're well positioned in terms of low cost. They're fairly resilient, but that's not a guarantee by any stretch of the imagination. There's all kinds of things that could go wrong, especially on the political risk side and the sort of leadership side, right? That we look out to 2040 or 2050, we can think of different ways that Russia and Saudi Arabia could run into trouble. If that happens, then probably the risk premium would go up for them as it has for other countries. And then the last point I'll make here before turning back to Randy is just about North America, which is where I spent most of my career focused on the US and Canada. Now it's interesting because right now the data show that US and Canada are fairly high greenhouse gas intensity in aggregate. I think the message of the study is that these countries will have to bring that greenhouse gas intensity down in order to re retain access to capital and compete with the Saudis and Russians. But the study also suggests that there's a pretty good chance that they'll get that right. That we have the human capital, we have the technology, we have the financial markets to, to bring down the greenhouse gas intensity of even the oil sands or you know the US shale. But we have to the policy framework and politics right, which could be where the greater risk is here. So that was a very brief overview of the paper. There's a lot more there, uh, you know, and I look forward to the comments from my fellow panelists and from the audience. RJ, thank you so much. Um, really fantastic presentation. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to read the full report, uh, the link to which we put in the chat. Uh, before, before we turn to Q&A, and if you do have a Q&A and the questions in the audience, please start putting them in there so we can start getting to those. I want to turn to Amy and Chris first, just for their initial responses to RJ. So Amy, over to you. Well, I, I think RJ um, has made just some excellent observations. Lo love the methodology, very interesting way of doing it. Um, of course, you know, one always has these problems with methodology when you're taking sort of an aggregate uh, of, you know, how the answer comes out, but I do agree. Um, it's the study should be a wake up call uh, for the majors in the US industry that they do need to address uh, the carbon intensity of their production if they're going to sort of win in the game. Um, RJ, I know the written study goes into sort of the prospects um, for you know North America where when you're talking about shale, I can inject my investment quickly and get my return out quickly. Um, and so I do think that there will be some players, even a player like Russia, um, might be greatly disadvantaged because of the geography of their resources. In other words, they're in the Arctic, you have to plan, it takes a long time. Um, and then you're gonna have these climate change effects that are gonna make it harder and harder to um, develop oil in the Arctic, whether that's melting permafrost or the fire risk, um, you're gonna have sort of some bigger challenges there. Um, but the one thing that you didn't touch upon um, that I think we should discuss as we're talking about it today, because I do agree with you um, that the fragile states, as you uh, coined them, um, are, are not uh, preparing in the way that the Gulf states are preparing, even when it comes to thinking about, should I diversify my export products in the energy sector, and, and, and how am I going to handle that? Um, I think one of the big concerns I have is that you have this giant sovereign debt market that is uh, for both national oil company debt, like Pemex has something, I forget the number, $24 billion in debt coming due in 2024. Um, and so when we saw the COVID crisis hit um, and we had that giant slack off of demand and there was a tussle about, you know, how we were going to allocate this loss of demand, you know, sort of a pretest for the kinds of things that you're describing could happen more slowly and could be planned better. Um, the thing that really struck me at that time in talking to US government, G7 leaders, um, and the OPEC leaders themselves, uh, was this primary concern that there not be a failure in the sovereign credit market. And, um, and so that makes this whole transaction that you're describing much more complex. You have some African countries that have pre-sold their oil forward. You have some debt that's collateralized by the sort of it assumed value of oil. And uh, I don't think that, I think that, you know, we've seen some severe adjustments in the stock price 
of um, you know a, a company like Exxon Mobil. Um, but we have not really seen that same sort of risk adjustment for this kind of thinking um, in the sovereign lending space, because you mentioned, in fact, that the sovereigns have cheaper uh, cost of capital. Um, but one would imagine that over time, um, markets are going to adjust to this perception of the higher risk to collateralize with oil. And that might not happen this year because, you know, we're all banshees on the roaring 20s and whether or not the demand is going to come back or not. Um, or are we having a commodity boom cycle? Um, maybe the fact that China had a new problem with the pandemic might cool that off a little bit over time, depending on how they manage that. But, but I do think this extra element of, um, of financial markets and also just the sort of the, the justice issue from a global perspective, if you're a country like Ghana and you're just getting to gear up and benefit from oil production, do you have a higher right uh, to produce your oil um, than a country that is, you know, higher cost and had a longer time to, to you know, exploit the wealth? Um, and then when we look at, you know, how do we think about these countries and their credit situation? Um, you know, how does that compare to the fact that there are a lot of low income and middle income countries that need assistance uh, to cope with climate change and to cope with the pandemic? So I just kind of throw that out as sort of a geopolitical context. Um, when you think about the United States and the history of intervention as fragile states deteriorate, um, I think there's a big challenge uh, for US foreign policy. I talk about this specific challenge in my book two minute plug, energy's digital future. And, um, and, and I, I'm great, glad to see Atlanta Council taking it on because it's a really big topic. It needs more debate. Amy, thank you so much. And I wanna make sure we come back to some of these uh, issues you raised, particularly the sovereign debt issue, which I think is a big one. But first let's hear from Chris. And Chris, if you have any thoughts about RJ or anything that Amy said as well, so over to you. I have a lot of thoughts about RJ, but let me talk about his report. Um, you know, I mean, the first thing is, really congratulations is a really interesting report which i think just provokes so much conversation which is uh um you know and it's really hard to think where to start i read through the report and uh, and, and ij you've done a great summary i think the first thing i start with is what we've learned through the pandemic is forecasting is really really difficult so everybody's moved to doing scenarios because scenarios are much easier in reality. You just say, well, let's make some assumptions. Let's look at some extremes. And this was, is what it could look like. But we know that the reality is, is it won't look like that. So let's just remember that most of those things that you looked at are scenarios. They help us think about what might need to be done. And the IEA's net zero scenario is exactly that. It's got a lot of press, but when you, I spent this week with them and a few other people, and it was like, no, this is about trying to think about the call on other resources like metals, uh, you know, the social and, econ and, and economic consequences of trying to get to two degrees. It never is, was intended to suggest that it's how the world is going to look. And your know, reality is right now, it doesn't look anything like that. And when we look at our own forecasts, um, we can see that, you know, it's going to be very difficult to bend the curve of oil demand. And so when you then put that context and that the way this report is written and the way it's trying to think, it's trying to say that, well, we're going to start seeing less investment and we're starting to feel that the access to capital, the risk pressures are changing for IOCs, whether it's the Dutch courts, whether it's the shareholder activism uh, on Exxon, all of this is pushing them away from investing in production. And so therefore, one of the key premises I saw in RJ's report, which you didn't touch on, which is an assumption that we're moving to potentially lower energy prices versus perhaps an assumption that we're moving to higher uh, oil and energy prices. Why? Because effectively we're going to underinvest. And then perhaps the fragile uh, and failing states are going to get a leg up because their oil is going to be worth so much money because we have underinvested. So I think that's something to think about. What I really like about the report is the way you look at uh, carbon intensity. Personally, I think putting 20% um, on carbon intensity is too low. I'd be putting 50%. I personally believe that the way in which we create a, um, an energy transition that is smooth is that you put a true value on that carbon. You drive towards 
the world wanting to consume lower carbon intensive oil. We've done this with gasoline. We've moved from high sulfur to low sulfur by setting uh, sort of um, regulation over what the sulfur should be and let the market resolve for the value of it. We need to do that for oil. And that is where I think the risk exists for some of the failed states because they have high energy and, uh, and intensity, high carbon intensity for that oil. And therefore that oil gets priced out of the market because it's too expensive versus the low carbon intensity, which you talked about rightly uh, so is uh, existing in the Middle East. And I think that's the driver. At Platts, we are going to be rolling out low carbon oil indices um, and a set price assessments to drive a, a, a transition towards that oil because we've got to decarbonize. We don't believe that you're going to get down to anywhere near those sort of numbers of oil demand. So therefore, let's try and focus on addressing the carbon and, then, and, and in, energy intensity of that. A couple other little points. I mean, I think you talked about um, things like uh, um, the US perhaps being stronger. Uh, and maybe better, more re resilient or robust, I suggest that actually the US has got bigger risk, regulatory risks about bans on fracking, bans on uh, you know, uh, exploration. And so you, know, you may well see that. But in, in a way, that there's some logic around that. One of the other things I thought your report brought out, which I thought was really interesting, was the total capital we need. We need to spend more capital for the energy we're going to have, even if you transition away from oil to renewables, because you spend so much on renewables. The opportunity for the US is actually to stimulate its economy by investing in renewables. It creates more jobs. It's more localized. Um, and as a consequence, renewables is better for growing an economy and moving away from oil. That opens up, again, perhaps those fragile and failed states to fill that gap. Lastly, what does this mean for China? If China is, you know, is looking at this from a slightly different perspective in your report, which suggests lower oil prices, but we are, I'm suggesting higher oil prices, well, China is going to continue to want that relationship with the likes of Angola, the likes of Venezuela. And so there's a real danger if we don't have a global agreement about carbon intensity, all we do is we open up the higher carbon intensity to move into somewhere like China to be able to consume that in the short term. It says peak carbon by 2030, so it's got plenty of capacity to do that. So I think there's a lot of little bits and, and, and that we need to think about of the, what I, we often find is the unintended consequences um, of some of the, the thinking here. And so I, I just put some of that out there. I think this report is just really thrown so many different ideas and I, I agree with a lot of comments Amy made around you know access to capital and and, and sovereign wealth funds etc um, but it could be they are the winners in a world in which we you know we over forecast the downturn in demand and they just take take the opportunity and look, look just last point there look at where Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia are right now their actual uh, you know fiscal break evens from an oil perspective, Saudi's come down from $97 a barrel to roughly around $70 a barrel. And as it increases its production to 12 million barrels, which it's likely to do, it's going to come down to sub $60. And so they're looking at these prices right now and going, we're really looking pretty okay. And at the same time, we can afford to diversify our economy. And we've got another source of energy, hydrogen, solar, wind, et cetera, to bring on. So these are really exciting times. And I think you know these debates are always far more complicated. And I'm sure you've been grappling with RJ. So I hope that sort of throws this debate wide open. Thanks, Randy. Chris, thank you. Um, RJ, I want to give you a chance to respond to both Amy and Chris. And I have a question, and we have a ton of questions coming in in the Q&A. So um, try to, let, let's try to keep this moving very quickly. Yeah, I'll give my rapid response. Those are great, great comments, and thank you, thank you for those all around. Just starting with Amy, I think, absolutely, I think the idea of producer diversification, right? Will the fragile and failed states be able to do their own sort of Saudi vision 2030? They have the resources. You know, the human capital, the support to 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 go beyond petroleum, and and what will that look like, right? And part of the modeling here is that the, it'll probably be a, a more of an uphill climb due to the lack of resources. And there's also a sense of urgency, right? Angola has, you know, a 14 year reserve to production ratio, and they're not getting a lot of new investment now. So this could become a very material question very quickly. Totally agree that sovereign credit is a hugely interesting topic. That's why I wanted to include that cost of capital data. I would argue right now that we already see the fragile and failed states 
are paying a, a bigger premium every year, right? Because I think the market's getting more and more skeptical about their viability as sovereign, as, you know, investment grade sovereign entities in a world of, you know, peak demand, which again, as Chris said, may not be where we get to, but for the purpose of this study, that's where we were. Uh, and then just lastly on Amy's comments, just fascinated by Russia, right? And I think that's why I put it as its own category because I couldn't think of another country like Russia that has that much production, that has its own political system, that's gonna have the physical climate change impact that you have, that has the Arctic, you know, all those things. So I, I put it as its own category in the study for a reason. I think we think the same on that. And that would be a great follow-up for sure. Uh, and, and by the way, in terms of the high in intensity poverty countries, just to shout out for Carbon Tracker International, did a great study on how all of these things we're talking about will affect those smaller African producers, the ones that have like 50,000 barrels a day here, 100,000 barrels a day, they're going to be quite traumatic for those countries as well. In terms of Chris's comments, you know, I agree, I, you know, again, I agree that this question of bending the curve, right, and, you know, do we take these net zero type scenarios or production gap report type scenarios as gospel? Clearly not, but you can imagine certain political realities that would could get us in that direction. And the production gap report is so fascinating to me because the ideology behind that simply says produce less oil, right? That's the fastest way to decarbonize the planet. So versus CCS and hydrogen and EVs and everything else. So that, that's a really interesting idea to come back to. What you really hit the nail on the head, as you tend to do, is that I think I really struggled with this idea of the fragile and failed states potentially outperforming. And I think that it's two sides of the coin, right? That if, if the US and Canada get the policy wrong and ESG wipes out those resources prematurely, which frankly, the Canadians are already on the cusp of that, as you know, as you and I have discussed many times, right? And Shale may not be that far behind given the current administration. If that happens, then yes, I think the fragile and fa failed states will outperform. You know, Eurasia Group had Iraq as a top risk for 2021 because we had, when we wrote the report in November 2020, we had $35 crude and Iraq was floundering. At $70 crude, there, you know, things are not perfect, but they're a hell of a lot better and they certainly would not be in our top risk, right? As Chris, as you understand very well. And then lastly, in terms of carbon intensity, I agree. I think if I could do it again, I probably would put a higher carbon intensity score. And I think it's worth, you know, sampling stakeholders and talking to the industry about how they are putting that calculation in. But I think what I will do is rerun that model with different weightings and, and see what we get, right? It'll probably be very damaging for Canada and for the fragile and failed states. Uh, and that, that will be an interesting conclusion. I agree that's the direction that we're headed, right? That the, the absolute level of oil demand may not decline as fast as the net zero emission scenario hopes. And therefore the carbon intensity of that oil will become even more important. RJ, thanks so much. Um, I, I want to ask a follow-up question that ties into something that Doug Hangel asked, but you you wrote in the report about the importing countries. You didn't. We haven't talked about that yet, um, and and how they will be impacted by this. Now, uh, Doug asks about China and India and and how they will respond. But I want to add a, a piece to that, which is particularly on China, how they are also looking to sort of win the the EV race and the clean tech race at the same time. So perhaps you can talk a little bit just about how you view uh, importing countries in, in these two scenarios. Yeah, I think not just China and India, but also Japan and Korea, right? It's not that long ago when I started Eurasia Group in 2006 that Japan and Korea were hoping to, to find oil plays that had been, you know, were too risky for the Chinese. So they're looking at Sudan and all these, all these places. We're in a very different world now, clearly. That suggests to me their energy security is improving. Mm -hmm. Right, that there, that it's more of a of a of a, a buyer's market than it has been in the past. There's less supply shock risk, you know, with the Straits of Hormuz and all these things, perhaps. Um, so that's one side of it. Right, is are those big energy consuming regions, Europe, Japan, Korea, China, India, less exposed to supply shock risks? Do they have to take less risk in you know developing oil with their national oil companies in unstable markets? I think the answer to those is yes. The other side of the question that you asked is. What about the emerging energy industries, right? The clean energy industries, the zero emissions sectors. And I think the combination of those two factors is quite interesting for China, right? Have, having, we've always argued at Eurasia Group that energy security is about diversification by geography uh, and by fuel, right? And, and, and China clearly has made gains in that, those categories in the last 10 or 20 years, but they're also making gains in being a leader in wind and solar and electric vehicles Right, so so that 
not just domestically, but exporting those technologies and influencing those supply chains globally as well. So yes, I think in the paper, I didn't mention as much in my presentation, but we do discuss the relative gains in security for those consuming states. Uh, not that they wouldn't still be affected by short-term disruptions, uh, but they're probably not as structural uh, as they once were. And then yes, there are new dynamics emerging in some of the clean tech sectors as well. Got it. Um, now, I, we have a question from uh, Eli, Eli uh, Rettig, and it ties to something that Chris said, but uh, these, these uh, clean technologies are not just being developed by China. Um, uh, UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia are diversifying into clean energy as well. So, um, and, and as they're looking to diversify their economies, but uh, Eli asks, um, it, it looks like the GCC countries would be the, the last man standing and only increase their share of exports depending on which scenario, uh, but at least they will still be in, in this situation continuing to produce oil. So uh, Eli asks, is there a point to their economic diversification efforts? Can the G, uh, GCC countries continue to rely on oil into the mid 21st century and do they need to do this? So Chris, I, I, since you, you mentioned a diversification, over to you first on that. Well, there's a number of things a way to look at that. Number one is that I, I think the GCC countries are playing a very smart role about getting the, you know, taking the higher ground on this. They are decarbonizing their own economies because they have so much renewables. And by decarbonizing, they consume less fossil fuels themselves and they can export more. And they can see that they have low carbon intensity. Even more importantly, they're using things like uh, SMR, steam methane report forming to make hydrogen CO2 and use the CO2 in order to improve the enhanced oil recovery of their oil. So now they're making their oil even lower carbon intensity, making hydrogen and exporting hydrogen. Um, you know, ultimately, they are not only sitting on all the ancient sunlight, they're sitting on all of today's sunlight. And it's no surprise that these two things are in the same place and they are going to be the energy center and the energy export in the future, whether it's the old world or the new world. Um, and so, you know, I think they, they see that and they see the opportunity and they're not going to suddenly say, well, we're going to stop making oil because they're not going to get forced by shareholders or regulators. But they do believe in setting out a, a lower carbon trajectory because in that world, they are absolutely the winners. Uh, and I, I think that's what they're, they're playing um, in that role. I think one of the other things I just want to say a little bit with the new technologies is that although we can see some of these technologies evolving, they take so long to have a true impact um, on fossil fuels. Whether it's looking at EVs in China, they're being sold 8% uh, of, of, of sales are, are EVs, but that means 92% are internal combustion engines, which are going to be around for at least 15 years. So yes, they're taking... But this is, you know, you cannot get rid of that stickiness. And this is what I worry about, you know, these, these scenarios. It assumes you're just going to get throw away all those old cars after five years and solve the problem. Or you're going to shut down those coal power plants, which have been built in the last five years. Most coal power plants are, you know, in, in their sort of 10 years old and they've got a 45 year life. So you have to work, away, work out how to get rid of uh, that capital stock. And lastly, just to look at renewables. We've built this year a record amount of renewables, 250 gigawatts of ins a new installed capacity. Yet it's only generating um, around about 50 gigawatts of, uh, um, of generated uh, um, electricity for a total increased demand of over uh, 100 gigawatts. And so in fact, this year, despite the record growth of renewables, we actually need to build more thermal capacity for the increase in demand. These are the, this is the math, and this is the math that we have to realize when we're trying to understand these scenarios and say, right now, the curve isn't bending, the curve is accelerating upwards, and yet we are doing incredible things so to let, accelerate things like EVs, let, to accelerate let, things let, like let me, let, me, let me weigh in for a minute, okay? There's a tendency in the oil and gas space to see a high price, which we have at this minute. And then we extrapolate how it's gonna last forever. And you know it's gonna bail everybody out and all the people who said that renewables were gonna do this or that are wrong. And, and it's like a momentum. And, and it's been a momentum for decades. So I'm not saying that Chris is wrong in anything he's saying. I just wanna sort of add a little you know, temperance right, uh, to, to our discussion. So I think the way you wanna think about it is this. 
if the price of oil is high, if it's actually going to cost me a lot to restart flying around and sending my business travelers around, it was actually going to cost me a lot. Would I actually do it? Or would I use video? Right? If I'm a government and oil prices are high, right? Does that give me more opportunity to do something else? I mean, one of the great things that you're saying about what the Saudis could do, which is to, you know, use more renewables internally and thereby free up oil for export, you know, the United States could do that too. We could do that on purpose, right? We could maintain our oil and gas jobs, decarbonize as we should, and for a period of time, have our oil and gas go out to the export market until, like we say, that market starts to drop off, right? So it's not a one for one. And indeed, there's this belief somehow that we would have these fragile states, they're going to collapse, oil prices would get high, and then governments would do nothing. But of course, we know that that never happens. So if your China and your economy starts to be tipped by the fact that you're buying a lot of expensive oil from the Middle East, why wouldn't you, because you have a command economy, press people into electric cars, press people into telecommuting, press people into e-commerce with trucks, which by the way, in China, have been moving more and more and more onto other fuels. Like why wouldn't you be proactive and I think the one thing that's been a big wild card, because I noticed there was a question in the chat, what's the X, right? The big thing that's changed with COVID is that this paradigm, the government can't make draconian policy that affects my personal choices, regardless of what country you're in, um, has now been knocked on its head because we've all had government make just incredible interventions. and. I and you know it could happen again if somehow there was this politics. I mean, we have lost Venezuela, we have lost um, Libya off and on, and we have some prospects uh, for production in certain places that's going to decline now because it's too high cost. And yet, you know, the market right now is not a hundred percent sanguine, but it's been sanguine up to now. And I think, you know, maybe we could adjust again because um, maybe the shale will come back a little bit or something else will come back a little bit. So I'm not convinced that we're out of the cycle. And I think that all this technology moves us back into the cycle more quickly. In other words, oil prices go up, it looks like it was gonna stay there. Then the technology floods into the market. Then everybody carpools because we can with Uber. Then, you know, we can, we can all go back to public transportation because we're in mass, whatever it is, right? I, I think that the response will still be a market response. Amy, that's a really interesting point that um, that that there are that the high prices might actually accelerate peak demand, but also that COVID has brought out a new variable in that, which is the tr the air travel piece, which beforehand there really we didn't at least see as an opportunity to cut out air travel from. From our lives or electric vehicles that could displace uh, demand from uh, passenger from passenger transport but now with zoom like we're doing now um, we have less of a reason to travel um, and so if the prices are high so so do you see that that in, that is an incentive and i, I want to do this to get to a question about opec that's in in the q a um, but an incentive to help manage the market in a way that keeps prices um, in a, in the sort of 60 dollar range say so Amy first, then Chris, then RJ on that, and then let and then let's talk about OPEC in these uh, in these scenarios that that uh, RJ has looked at. Well, I mean, take take this week, right? Take this week. If you're the Biden administration and you have it on the books that you can sell down the SPR because demand's going to go down over time, why wouldn't you do it now? Right, really? and you know. I mean, there's so many different things that governments can do temporarily when the price is high, right? And, and there, the inclination to do it, I think the constraints, you know, there was this constraint on the economy and this and that, uh, that I think has kind of, you know, been lifted, but there's so much technology that can be applied today. You know, I like to tell the statistic because it's so dramatic. You know, 
UPS, the first year they put the algorithm in so that your package delivery was not decided by the driver or somebody in the warehouse, but there was an algorithm that said what truck gets what packages and what minute do they get delivered? Because you know it's no longer the driver. That's why they can tell you your package is coming at 202, mm -hmm. right? So they eliminated 100 million miles of vehicle mile travel just in one year, just from putting in that computer program. But now we're talking about, you know, we don't move aerospace parts around anymore because they're 3D printed. So as we go forward in time, as the oil price goes up, and as I'm going to be able to do more electricity with renewables, which the cost of which is going to come down, right? Then, then my incentive to do things to avoid oil and the technologies that I have to do that, like, you know, if the traffic's bad and the price of gasoline's high, I might still go on vacation, but would I, would I drive uh, for a business trip or would I have a meeting? I have this friend who's a Wall Street uh, analyst who is joking with me that uh, he's never having lunch with me in Midtown again because there's no point dealing with the congestion. He'll just talk to me over Zoom, right? So, you know, and that's just within, you know, within New York itself, right? So. I just think there's just a lot of responses and, and we have all these strategic stocks. And the question is, are we gonna need them over time? We're gonna need them less if demand is gonna be pushed away by these other factors. You know, if the government wanted to reduce oil demand temporarily, could we just say that we're giving everybody a pass to Uber and only they can drive around and that has to be, you know, with an efficiency program and they could electrify? I mean, California has already put tailpipe standards on ride hailing fleets. And the ride hailing companies have already said they're gonna go electric. You know, what does that mean over time? If the price of oil is high, wouldn't you be better off if you're an Uber driver in an electric vehicle, it pays for itself. Chris. Well, number one is the US is already selling 200,000 barrels a day on their SPRs. So they're doing very nicely and uh, hope, and that's to uh, spend it all on building more roads. Um, hopefully for electric vehicles and hopefully charging uh, uh, points. But of course, uh, the US also only has a penetration of 2.3% uh, uh, EV sales and uh, SUV sales and RV sales have been f uh, growing at a far greater rate than uh, EV sales, which just shows consumer behavior. And that's the one area I just want to challenge a little bit is, I think one thing we've learned from the pandemic is it's very hard to change consumers' behavior. The reason why we've struggled to bring in control, people don't want to conform to it. People don't want to wear masks. People don't want to stay at home. And yes, governments have tried, but they've pretty much failed. And that's why we continue to, to go on this long, long stretch of you know, struggling to, uh, to get over through this. And I think this is the same thing with, with climate. If you don't see the, the, the virus, uh, if you don't see, uh, but yet you see people dying, with climate, it's even harder to see the consequences. Yes, some floods, yes, some uh, droughts, but most people don't feel it and are not, are not impacted by it. And so yet we're hoping that they will change their behavior. So ultimately it does come down to economics. And I agree a lot of the things that Amy said, but I'm not necessarily suggesting that we're moving to high oil prices. You're right now, we're and, and OPEC knows that, we're in a trajectory of somewhere in the 50 to 70 uh, uh, band, the, 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 the back of the curve has got a lot stronger. That suggests that people realize there's a little bit of a lack of investment in there, but it's still sub $70. And that doesn't change consumer behavior. The other thing is everyone talks about commuting. Everyone talks about business. I mean, ultimately, and business travel, ultimately, interestingly enough, in the US, only 25% of the travel is related to work. 75% of it is discretionary. And it's actually, you know, as soon as it opens up and people want to go to cinemas, want to go buying, they will do that. Also, what we've seen in the US is we've seen a tripling of e-commerce, a tripling. Now, what that means is the inventory over sales ratio is at a 20-year low. We cannot keep the US stocked. And they can't get truck drivers. They're trying to get truck drivers. And with that, that's increased 350,000 barrels a day of gas oil demand because we're trucking so many goods, most of it imported from uh, China, which is why the Chinese economy is growing at 18% uh, from an energy demand perspective, because we're moving so much Chinese goods and, and all this e-commerce. So I think you just have to look at all these things. I don't, don't want people to get me wrong. I am not suggesting that we cannot get to, to a two degree world. I'm just suggesting that things that Amy says that need to happen absolutely need to happen, but they are quite difficult to make happen without really significant intervention. 
And you know, we need to find the right levels of intervention if we are going to shift this, this curve. Price in itself is going to keep managing this up and down and OPEC understand that full well around their role in keeping enough oil in there, not to uh, uh, let uh, the, uh, the price overheat, uh, but also right now holding enough back to make sure that their economies are looking far stronger than they were pre-pandemic. RJ, thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, look, this is part of the challenge of this topic, right? Because you want to look at the geopolitics of peak demand and people want to argue about whether or not peak demand will happen. Nobody knows, right? I mean, the, the, all these factors we're discussing here, you know, there's all kinds of scenarios and forecasts, but I think it's become enough of a part of the public debate in government in the financial markets, the ESG community, that it's worth thinking about not how do we get to peak demand, but if we do, right? Let's. I agree with you guys. The, path, the most likely pathways to peak demand involve some combination of higher prices and and post COVID increase in radical government action. You know, aggressive action on climate, which is possible, right? Those are those are real possibilities. So the papers predicated on, on the idea that those things have happened, and then what, right? So on the question about OPEC. I agree with what Chris said, right? That OPEC will try to, you know, have that Goldilocks scenario of keeping prices high enough to minimize the amount of boring they need to do, the core OPEC countries, uh, but certainly not too high that you're gonna encourage substitution or demand disruption. But there's another possibility here, which is at some point the core OPEC countries, especially the Saudis and the OE, decide actually that game is over. We don't want to be this big producer anymore. We're going to take back our market share while we still can, because we are worried about these governments pushing for decarbonization for electric vehicles, et cetera. Now, what's interesting, I think, in that context is that I would argue that would accelerate the disruption of these fragile and failed states, right? That that would be the final split of OPEC, right? The rich would get richer and the poor would get, get poorer, essentially. And, and I think all of us on this call, at least the, the panel, have talked to the, some of those countries, and we know that, that they're thinking about that. It's a real option in the, in the toolkit. So, so that that would be approaching the market share question from from a different direction, but one that's driven by that longer term concern about peak demand being maybe not the base case for all of us, but a reasonable and real risk to consider. RJ, thanks. And you got to the question about OPEC uh, in uh, in the Q and A, so that's very that's very helpful. Um, I want to go to David Goldman's question, um, which which where he asks. Um, where the high volume, low unit cost producers like Guyana fit into this framework? Um, how, how do you think about a Guyana in, in this? So RJ first, then Chris, then Amy. I, I just think that the traditional perspective of, you know, let's go from low, low cost barrel with the highest return it is not the game anymore for most of these IOCs and, and global EMP companies, right? They're mostly now focused on either investing in non-oil businesses like electricity and you know uh, hydrogen and uh, biofuels, or to the extent they are investing in oil, it's what Amy said earlier about the short, shorter cycle resource or maybe some, some brownfield operations. And I think that the problem with a lot of those high, high volume, uh, lower cost fields is that the market won't assign them any value for those undeveloped reserves anymore, right? So if they're gonna take their capital and tie it up in exploration, the market's saying, well, that, that oil, those reserves aren't worth as much as they used to be because of stranded asset peak demand concerns. In my mind, at least, it makes the attractiveness of those jurisdictions that I agree with you has historically been very attractive, a lot lessened. I think the fact that the BPs and Equinors of the world are getting rid of their exploration divisions tells us a lot about their lack of appetite for those types of uh, types of resources. So it's not to say the, the appetite isn't zero, but I think that's part of the view here of why those are gonna be disadvantaged versus sort of building out you know, uh, established basins in places like the Middle East and Russia and North America. Got it. Chris, any, any thoughts? Chris, you're on mute. Uh, I mean, I'm, I don't think that uh, the main IOCs are abandoning um, the, you know, exploration. I think they're, they're abandoning the need to do lots of exploration because they know where the oil is. And so they don't need to do more. Big data is helping them to do that. Digitalization of fields is enabled. They know that tiebacks are much more effective and they create lower carbon intensive uh, um, oil. I think, you know, to the specifics of that question of Guyana, I think it's really interesting because it's, it's a, such a large play where you can tie more and more things in piece by piece. And what we're learning, what we're seeing, whether it's you know, Johann Sverdrup in the North Sea, 
what we're seeing is the ability for oil companies to go from FID to first production. The timing has gone right down. The average has gone down to less than three years. So it's pretty short cycle. But the initial production, instead of being, say, you know, 10 to 50,000 barrels a day, the initial production is 350,000 barrels a day. So the ability to relatively quickly, a relative, we're not talking about shale, uh, but it's relatively to being large volumes on is, 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 is significant. And so somewhere like Guyana is a really interesting one. The political risk is the issue for someone like Exxon there. But ultimately, you can just keep adding on well after well relatively easily. So, you know, I, I think there's, you know, there is this idea that we're under investing. There's this idea that the IOCs are backing out. They're not. They're being much more selective. It's low cost. It's, hard, it's, it's short FID to production time. It's high initial production um, and low carbon intensity. Tick those. They know those are the right barrels to go after. And I think that is the trend that we're going to see emerging. Just to clarify quickly, I, I agree with what Chris is saying. And just what I'm saying is that I think it's more about the next Guyana, right? I mean, absolutely. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to, to monetize the existing discovered resources in those types of markets. I was thinking more about the next one. That's all. I think that's fair, but I'm, I, I'm, I think there, we know enough that there is, there, is an, you know, there is enough plays which have been explored enough that you actually don't need to go into hard to find. Arctic's off now. You don't need to go there. There is plenty of oil. And, and you know, while we may be debating peak, peak oil is coming. That's not a question. It could be this decade, right? I would argue this decade for peak crude demand. It's the trajectory of how fast it comes down to your great chart that you showed is, you know, unless it comes down at the speed of the decline rates, which I think is very hard to do, you still have to find. And that's what they know. And that's what they're focusing on is those those fields and those uh, opportunities. If the investors will let them. <laughs> Amy, you want to go to you. OK, final uh, comment from you. Final, final comment or final point which is that uh, the Keystone decision is a different decision in the way the media is portraying it. The question is, does it make sense to build a 25-year asset today unless you're sure of demand? And that goes for long pipelines, that goes for Arctic development, that could go for an LNG that's not already green-lighted. Um, that to me is the pivotal change and whether or not people can or can't get the money, right, or the permit, it doesn't make sense. So if you're an, an exploration asset that's going to be totally greenfield, and it's going to have to be pipeline somewhere, I'm going to have to build a lot of infrastructure, that's much less attractive than even going to some place that's a little bit more high cost, but I'm going to be able to utilize declining infrastructure that I have nothing to put in it, right? So that's why I think the U.S. players still win because they can use all that infrastructure that's already built, right? And you're gonna have other places where that same is gonna be true. Um, so then it just gets down to, you know, where are my legacy assets? What else could I do with those assets if there's still demand apparent? And then how many years am I willing to put capital at risk and who will fund me to put that capital at risk? And, you know, I just closed with this like crazy idea that was a point at which, because they, they seem to be a little bit out of the woods now, but there was a point at which Exxon stock was falling so much like a stone that some people were saying behind their back that they were letting their stock fall so they could become a private company, right? So, you know, I don't think that's what they were doing, but the point is we will have some companies that are going to take themselves private um, because they might believe that there's still money that could be made and public markets might not be willing to back that. So uh, anyway, interesting way of thinking about it. But you've so, also made an interesting argument. I, I really like what you're talking about there for the failed states um, and that uh, RJ talked about, because indeed places like Iran, places like Iraq have that infrastructure and certainly don't have a shortage of oil um, and Nigeria. So just an interesting, uh, you, you brought, brought some of that lens perhaps to uh, RJ's study, which I think is a really interesting perspective. Actually, I, I totally agree with you. You're not going to buy it, build 25 year uh, infrastructure assets unless you can reuse it within the within the future energy transition. Um, RJ, I want to give you the last word. This is this is your report. And so your event. So uh, any final comments? 
No, look, it's, it's been a great discussion. I'm, I'm really grateful to everyone for, for all their inputs. And look, I, I just would like to say that this is not an exhaustive study, right? I think we did a lot of good work here, but as Chris suggested earlier, it was really designed to provoke exploration by experts on this topic, right? Because I just felt like it was understudied. And I think we've exposed and illuminated a lot of the issues that are out there. I really think that when we think about the Iraqs and Nigerias and Venezuelas of the world, right? Yes, they have the infrastructure, they have the low cost resource, but I think it's gonna come down to the carbon intensity and, and the appetite for that risk capital, which right now as of 2021 is horrible, <laughs> but it could improve. Or there could be companies going private or there could be more NOCs or something. That's gonna be the story I think uh, to watch going forward. And I think this idea of, of redoing the study with a, a higher weighting for the uh, carbon intensity will be will, would be very valuable and would help investors and governments and the public assess the relative merits of these upstream markets, you know, in these long term scenarios. RJ, thank you so much. Uh, we are out of time. Um, so, RJ, again, thank you for the great work here. Hugely appreciate uh, your partnership with Global Energy Center. Amy and Chris, thanks so much for joining us today and for your fantastic comments. I want to thank the audience uh, for, for joining us as well and for all the really, really great questions. Um, you can be sure to read the report. Uh, again, you can find it on the Atlantic Council website. It's called Shifting Gears. Um, and please tune in for another event uh, on the future of the energy system on Monday morning. Um, this event is in partnership with the Energy Futures Initiative, and it is on their new report called The Role of Natural Gas in a Decarbonized World. So please join us Monday morning at 9 a.m. for that. I want to thank everybody who helped put this event together, including Reed Blakemore, John Suen, Laura Macedo, and Peter Gonzalez. Um, really appreciate all of your help. And, uh, and Zainab Wernanen, uh, also, also is part of this. So thank you all. Uh, have a great weekend.